All right. Welcome everybody. Sorry for the momentary delay. We were experiencing a few technical difficulties, but I think we're back up and running. All right. Well, hey, welcome to our, architect our Architectural Control Committee webinar featuring Clint Brown, the man, the myth, the legend. I uh, appreciate the opportunity for you to join us, Clint. And uh, my name is Mitch Krause. I'm the Chief Operating Officer here at Goodwin and Company. And I'm also very pleased to present uh, Nicole Mascoro, uh, who is our uh, lead architectural uh, review uh, kind of coordinator in our Houston office, and uh, Dee Eaton, who is one of our community managers, invited them to join the panel here and just uh, participate in the conversation. Today's conversation is all about helping arch architectural control committees uh, succeed. I know there, with the recent legislative uh, changes that impacted communities across the state of Texas, many of the board members that occupied the roles on architectural control committees or ACCs, we'll call for uh, the, the balance of today's uh, conversation, um, that vacating those roles uh, meant a lot of new faces and a lot of new folks who are coming into this and uh, were begged to participate in many cases to say, hey, can you join us in helping review these, uh, these applications from your neighbors and help us uh, keep that process going. So we're gonna try to fill you in over the next hour on everything that you need to know to be successful in the role. We'll talk about uh, statutory requirements. We'll talk about the governing documents and uh, we'll have uh, Clint kind of walk us through uh, all the things that you need to know from a legal standpoint to be uh, successful. Uh, Clint, you wanna introduce yourself to uh, the group? Absolutely, Mitch. Thank you uh, and thank you all for having me today. So. My name is Clint Brown. I'm with the law firm Roberts Markell, Weinberg, Butler, Haley. Attorneys like their names, so <laughs> nice long acronym. I'm an equity shareholder with the law firm, and I lead our community association division here in the state of Texas. So again, Mitch, thank you all for having me. As Mitch mentioned, this is kind of an ACC 101 for all you new ACC members or board members that are having to kind of interact with the ACC. What do the new laws do to us? And then what does it mean to be on the ACC? So I'm an attorney, got to give my attorney disclaimer. The information presented today is based on the law as it exists as of today, November 17th, 2021. Additionally, the information I'm going to be presenting today with Mitch and Nicole and Dee is for educational purposes and does not constitute legal advice. So after this meeting, if you need legal advice, please reach out to your legal counsel. He, she, or they should be able to help. With that, let's dig right in. So again, roles and responsibilities. And Go Clint, ahead, just a, a brief housekeeping note. Uh, everybody should have access to navigate to the chat function in Zoom. Uh, many of you guys are familiar with this because that's what we're doing board meetings these days. So uh, feel free to navigate to the chat uh, for the purposes of today's webinar. We won't be unmuting anybody. You can ask your questions. I also have a list of questions that were received during the registration process. And we're gonna save some time uh, at the end to make sure we address those. But also if there's something that comes up during the discussion that you feel um, you, you need to, to ask, please, please make sure that you uh, uh, let us know and we'll be monitoring that chat throughout the conversation today and get, get to you. Perfect. Thanks, Mitch. All right. So here's what we're going to be kind of focusing on today. Number one, what are architectural control guidelines? What do they do? How are they enforced? How are they implemented? Who, who adopts them? Who changes them? Uh, should you have an architectural control committee? Question mark. What if your documents don't speak to an ACC? Uh, next up is the approval process and violations, and then responding to homeowners with delinquent fines or assessments. And then finally, we're going to kind of wrap this all up with all the legislative changes that happened as it relates to architectural control committees. And one more point I, I want to make here, a lot of what we're going to be chatting about really applies to single family residential communities. Now, condominiums, a lot of them uh, nowadays look like single family communities. And those condominium regimes that look like a single family uh, community 
actually have ACCs as well. They may be called architectural review committees or something along those lines. So a lot of the principles we're gonna be chatting about apply to those types of condominiums as well. But I'll do my best to carve out 209 because 209, chapter 209 of the Texas Property Code technically does not apply to those types of condominiums. All right, so what are architectural control guidelines? So the first thing you've got to look for and look at are what are called your association's deed restrictions. A lot of synonyms for deed restrictions, declaration, CCNRs, DCCNRs, DADs, mm -hmm. development area declaration. All of those um, documents and acronyms refer to the same thing, your deed restrictions. And those restrictions are really what lay the framework for the look and requirements of the, the, of, of the homes in the community. Now, specific issues may not have been contemplated during that framework uh, drafting and implementation. And so what do we do when the declaration may say, hey, you can build a shed as long as your ACC approves it? Well, what kind of sheds are approvable? What dimension, square footage, height, material? And that's when your architectural control guidelines really come into play. It, it helps to resolve ambiguity in your deed restrictions. So architectural control guidelines helps to resolve ambiguity. We've got a lot of new ACC members. Many of you may be on the phone right now what we're gonna be talking about with these guidelines are ways to remove the ambiguity as much as possible so that you really have a good laundry list um, of what you can approve and should not approve. What happens if the developer never instituted any guidelines? So Mitch, I'm in a community, there are no guidelines for our community. Does that mean I just get to adopt guidelines because I want to? And I, the answer is you have to look to your deed restrictions to make sure you are authorized to adopt guidelines. Get with your community management team at Goodwin. You may have to get with your council as well. Uh, he, she, or they may have to look at your deed restrictions to see whether or not you've got clear authority. But many times Mitch or one of Mitch's team members can look and say, yes, look at this article, look at this section. It says you can adopt guidelines. And if it's not black and white, you may have to look, look to your council to see if you've got that type of authority. And for um, our chapter 204 communities, so those communities that are in the Houston area, uh, chapter 204, there's a statute that gives guideline creation authority. So again, you may be able to rely on that section of the Texas Property Code to adopt guidelines. All right, so what do guidelines do? What's their, their purpose? Again, we've got a general deed restriction. You have to get ACC approval before painting your home, before building a structure in your backyard. So what do these guidelines go into? What kind of colors are, are okay for the community? Fencing requirements, landscape, location of ancillary structures, your gazebos, your sheds. Can you even have a shed? and then um, structural, residential structural material requirements. So that is a lot of the information that can go into guidelines. If you've already got a set of guidelines, you may be able to just amend them and, and update them and provide more information on areas the ACC is having problems with. Another important thing that Nicole kind of mentioned uh, towards the beginning, prior to our presentation today, we were chatting, and you've got to remember, in order for a guideline to be enforceable, it must be recorded in the real property records in the county where the property is located. If it is not recorded, it is not enforceable. I can't count how many times I've seen these guidelines pop up and I'm like, oh, where's the recorded version? And the manager or ACC member responds with, they're not. So keep that in mind. And Mitch, you, you were mentioning something on maybe colors on exterior paint, mm -hmm. you know, how to develop that for your community. 
Yeah, I mean, there's there's all kinds of, uh, I think the, the hardest part to, to doing this is that, you know, as a committee member, you'll go into the governing documents and you'll try to make sense of, you know, what speaks specifically to paint colors, right? Like what's, uh, you know, okay, give me the lay of the land of how, what types of paint that I can approve. And oftentimes you'll find that there's a lot of gray area. Right. I mean, there there are things that require both the committee working in tandem with the board and management to figure out, you know, how do we define these things to make it an easier user guide for the homeowner to be able to manage the process. And um, and so one example of that is that rarely, if ever, is there going to be something in the documents that states, OK, if you've got this color roof, you can have this color trim and you've got you know this paint color. And so uh, sometimes you'll see things like, you know, all earth tones are acceptable or earth tones are a pretty wide palette. Um, and so what does that look like and what do we do there to define you know, what specifically we want to drive people toward? Um, and then there's another, you know, to your point, there's, um, there are documents that were written 20, 30 years ago and didn't take into account uh, the evolution of a community and everything else that goes along with that. And so, um, you know, how do we get specific? How do we create some, uh, uh, some, some clarity to this so that when someone is going down the path of making an improvement, painting their home, doing whatever they're doing, that there's very clear um, you know, there's a very clear steps to follow. Perfect. And so Mitch, to kind of follow up on that, when, when we're dealing with architectural guidelines, we've really got two circumstances. So circumstance number one, we don't have any, right? So let's assume we're dealing with a large community, a 2000 home community. So very big community, and we just don't have a good set of guidelines. So what do we do kind of first step, get with your, your team at Goodwin, number one, and your council, and you may actually have to retain the services of a landscape architect mm -hmm. or an architecture firm that has engineers, landscape architects, because they are the ones that are gonna kind of come out, look at the community and figure out what type of aesthetic styling mm -hmm. the community is. And then they're gonna help develop kind of that base set of guidelines for you. And then you work with Goodwin and your council to really tweak it finalize it, and then adopt it. And for you board members that are on the phone right now, it is important to remember that adopting guidelines most of the time is a two-party process. You've got the board giving input, but you also have the ACC. You really want ACC buy-in on these guidelines because it's gonna be, it's gonna be the document that your ACC is gonna rely on in reviewing these improvement applications. Now, if we're dealing with a smaller community, maybe 400, 300 homes, maybe we don't have to hire that expert. And you can rely on your council or Goodwin to give you suggestions on various improvement aspects for your community. And then you tweak it as you and the ACC see it uh, to, to provide some clarity. And then finally, amending your guidelines. Let's say you've got a base set. That is a lot easier to do. That's just working ACC and board together with Goodwin and council. So keep all that in mind. You know, guidelines are things that can be adopted and amended and changed uh, either through the board or through the board and ACC. So it is not something, I've almost never seen this, it's not something that requires a vote of your ownership. Right. Yeah. And so one example of that uh, to a uh, point earlier was, uh, there are paint manufacturers that I've worked with in the past that will work on designing a color book for the association where there's different paint chips that will identify, you know, here's 10 different ways that you can paint your home. And these are the acceptable, uh, you know, color schemes in the community based on what's already in place and or uh, what's going to be acceptable down the future that makes it uh, easier for folks. But to your point, um, uh, you know, the documents often have this kind of sweeping language that says, or whatever else the, you know, board of directors or architectural control committee deem proper. And so I think a lot of folks use that as the basis for their decision making to say, well, I've got kind of these wide sweeping powers that I right. can enforce there. And you might. Um, but the reality is, is that if you're inconsistent in that application, it could lead to concerns with, um, you know, future projects. Yeah, so consistency is huge to Mitch's point. So basically, 
The ACC gets to rely on this standard of care as well. Uh, Y'all are volunteers, ACC members are volunteers, but you've got this kind of standard of care uh, that a lot of courts look to for ACCs, kind of good faith, ordinary care and reasonableness. We try to apply, there's a statutory standard that basically says the board's actions or the association's actions are presumed reasonable. So the decisions you make, you kind of get this presumption of reasonableness and we try to apply that to the ACC as well. And, and here's the caveat, unless the other side can show that your decision-making was arbitrary, capricious, or discriminatory. So back to Mitch, Mitch's comment, you've got to be consistent in what you approve and what you deny, because if, if you aren't, then the owner that you deny can make an argument that you are being arbitrary or you're discriminating against me because I'm a protected class, gender, age, race, ethnicity, all things that may have nothing to do with why the ACC did what they did, but the owner is still going to make that argument. And it makes it more difficult if, you know, knock on wood, there's a lawsuit. And, and I want to speak to this litigation and, and this volunteer idea as well. ACC members, y'all are volunteers, just like board members are. So you get to enjoy what's called qualified immunity. Uh, you are a volunteer, you should be able to enjoy that qualified immunity, but what you need to do, and again, this should be standard for insurance, but get with your, your management company to ensure that ACC committee members or committee members in general are added to the association's insurance policy so that there is coverage in, in the event some decision of the ACC gets challenged and um, there's some sort of litigation or, or other issue that arises. But keep in mind, you do get that immunity bubble. I could spend an hour talking about immunity, so we won't <laughs> yeah. go there, Mitch. Don't scare hey. away our new volunteers, Clint. That's right. <laughs> I'm not trying to scare you. I, I, it's, it's a good thing. It's this bubble of protection. So you as a volunteer feel good about that um, and, and, and lean on your board when you need to, lean on your manager and good one when you need to. And then if you ever need counsel, lean, lean on them as well. I just wanna add two things to what you were talking about earlier. Um, uh, amending or adopting guidelines and such, just a reminder that they can't contradict. No, you were just about to say that. <laughs> no, go, go ahead. Yeah. yeah, I was just saying they can't, uh, contradict any restrictions that already exist because those supersede any guidelines. And the other thing I was going to say is that a lot of a lot of guidelines say that or whatever the committee approves. And uh, I've gotten into situations where ACCs um, see that it says, you know, the shingle color is weathered wood or anything else that we approved. And so for a long time, there was a fight in the neighborhood because weather wood has changed a lot. Charcoal is very popular right now. You know, trends of what houses look like change. And, um, you know, there was a big um, push for the scope to be, you know, brought into include charcoal and such and not just strictly for weathered wood. So. Um, I just always encourage people to, to say, what do your documents say that you're authorized to do? Just don't try to add other words in there. What do your documents actually say? Yeah, one thing that can get confusing to new committee members as you're looking through your documents set is that there's also, especially for those of you who are living in communities that have been in existence for many years now, uh, there are amendments that happen over time. And we've seen you know, a number of things through legislative changes that have uh, created a requirement for an association to adopt certain uh, allowances to a homeowner. One of those, or you know, think of a couple, right? Uh, uh, plant, uh, solar panels, solar panels, water, um, rain barrels, rain barrels. Uh, there was uh, zero scaping, uh, and now most recently we've got uh, front yard you know, security measures. Yep. And, uh, so when you're looking at, let's say, your CCNRs that were written in the 70s, and now you, you know, we've had the, this series of changes, you want to make sure you've got a complete document set. We work very diligently to update those and include those in your community's website and, and have a whole set there. But sometimes they're very difficult to navigate because something will be, you know, essentially contradictory because the, the, the changes uh, legislatively have led to 
um, you know, now requiring us to allow some of these things. Yeah, so Mitch raises a really good point and, and education is key, right? So we've got our new members on and, and this falls on the board and, and then working with your management team and making sure they're aware. You've got to make sure your ACC has the right documents because they do not want to inadvertently rely on the 70s declaration that says no solar panels or you know maybe a maybe 90s declaration i don't think solar panels were around in the 70s but uh, basically making sure you've got the proper documentation in hand number 1 cannot contradict existing restrictions i think that is a huge point so if your restrictions say an owner can install a shed your guidelines cannot say no, sheds are not allowed you cannot contradict and then the other point that I think was a good one is, or anything the ACC approves. So in order to remove that subjectivity, mm -hmm. add those rules and regs to say what or anything the ACC approves, right? Say what those are so that your ACC knows exactly what is approvable and what is not. And if the ACC gets a request that they think is in keeping with the times and is in keeping with the aesthetic appeal of the community, well then, you know what? Let's go ahead and amend the guidelines to add that as something okay, so that you've got a rule you can rely on. I think guidelines more than any other document in the association wheelhouse is, is by far considered the most living document out there because times change, styles change, sometimes from year to year. Mm -hmm. So it's really important to, to, you know, encourage that change when you need to and give your ACC a good set of guidelines to follow. Mm -hmm. Do we need to have those published? So let's say, I mean, is it just something we need to have filed in or is it something we need to have published and announcing when there is a filed document like that? Yeah, so, you know, if it's going to be a rule the ACC is going to enforce, it needs to be recorded. So, yeah, absolutely get it recorded in the real property records. And, you know, maybe you have to freshen it up every year or every two years. And then after five years of freshen ups, right, amendments, maybe you do an amendment and restatement. So getting back to Mitch's point to avoid the confusion and the multitude of documents. So, do an amendment and restatement. So an amendment and restatement is when you take amendments one through nine and you incorporate them into one document so that it takes all of them, puts them into one document. So you're back to one document mm -hmm. rather than having to look at the base document and nine amendments. It, it really helps to make it easy for your owners and your ACC and board. Yeah, it is worth, <laughs> it is worth the, uh, it is certainly worth the investment and the effort to do that. It simplifies everything and uh, it just consolidates all of these changes and, and the evolution of those documents over time. We've got communities that have, you know, 40 different amendments and you got to navigate through each one and it becomes very, uh, you know, very challenging. Yep. Nicole, I think, yeah, all of the recorded documents have to be published on the uh, yeah public side of the website for sure. Yeah, so um, I guess my question is for my community, for communities that have, I mean, I kind of know the answer, so I'm kind of asking for, for the people that are on as well, but I have some communities, um, a, a large number that don't have architectural guidelines at all. So my new architectural members are not struggling. It's just more complicated. It just makes everything more complicated when they're then, trying to make themselves feel confident about the decision they're making, but they have no guideline other than the kind of vague CCNRs that's in front of them, like paint colors. It doesn't really touch on paint colors except earth tone, earth tone. There's, uh, there's oranges, there's yellows, there's blues mm -hmm. in earth tone. So when you say earth tone, you know, I had, I have a sky blue. Um, someone is saying that blues are sky blue, but if you look up earth tone, earth tone is included blue. So they just make things so much easier. I'm dealing with such a big prob problem right now because of not filed guidelines. So <laughs> makes it so much easier on everybody all the way around. For sure. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so, all right. Should we even have an ACC? Do we need one? So prior to September 1st, the answer was 
what kind of community are, are you dealing in? Um, I always recommend ACCs, but sometimes your documents didn't have any authority. So there was no improvement authority. It simply said, here are their deed restrictions and you have to get approval of the board. The majority of deed restrictions nowadays, you know, made in the 90s forward, all have the requirement to get approval of the ACC, but deed restrictions for 70s, 60s, 70s and 80s communities may only require the approval of the board. Now, effective September 1st, you must, it's not may, it's must have an architectural review committee. ARC is what the statute calls it. Most documents call them architectural control committees. With a caveat, I suppose, unit count, lot yeah. count in a community? Yeah, so there is the, the only exception to the rule, to, to Mitch's point, is lot count. I think the magic number is 40. Um, but yeah, if you are above that lot count, that 40 lot count, you are legally required to have an architectural review committee or ACC. And largely before that, and those were individuals, the board would handle that. It was just a responsibility of the board. And many of the communities that we're working with, uh, when that like, that change came down, made it very, very difficult for someone to make a decision. I have to either choose to serve on the ACC committee where am I most valuable to this community? And many of those boards with great institutional knowledge had to you know, step off the board and, and serve in a, an ACC capacity. So it's uh, uh, certainly an important function in, in all communities. Oh yeah, no, it's, it's huge. Um, and it, look, it stinks. A lot of the communities I represent, and I'm sure Goodwin represents, there's a lot of frustration right now because it is so hard to find volunteers mm -hmm that are willing to put in the hours, right? This is not a five minute a week type job. This takes a lot of action. And I'll talk about why it does here, here in a minute because of what happens if you don't act diligently when you get an application. So again, it's all about the process. Uh, you know, an application gets filed, what's included in the application. I think Goodwin's got a very good procedure and process in place to help associations make sure they're their application process is clean and understandable and what kind of documents you need to attach to the application. All things very important to think about when you're developing your application process, uh, number one. Number two, look to your deed restrictions because they may tell you exactly what you can ask for. Sometimes it's very broad stroke and you can ask for anything you want to that's reasonably related to the ACC. Other times, it tells you exactly what you can request. So make sure you look at that when you're designing your process. And I, I will say, and this is something that, Nicole, you can speak to a little more, but um, many of the communities we work with, we've partnered with to um, make it really easy, right? And so this is something I encourage everyone to do is look at, um, so our community websites are a great place to start. Our community websites are easily, um, uh, can be easily modified via town square. Uh, there's a section, if you have the permissions, if you're on the board of directors, or um, if you work with your manager, we can go in and edit a community website very clearly. You don't need to know HTML or anything else. Uh, you can create a subsection on the website that addresses architectural committee, you know, architectural improvements. And, um, and one of the things that I love that many of our committees have done is that they create kind of the top 10 list, right? They, they create what are the, you know, in the vast majority, 90% of the applications you're going to get are going to be about uh, what do I do if I want to install an fence, if I want to install maybe a pool or something significant in the backyard, if I want to paint my home, um, if I want to remove a tree, what are the top 10 things that people are going to submit an application for? And, and then just offer some bullet points on, you know, here's what you need to know in order to make that, that improvement. Here are the things that the committee needs to have in order to approve your application. One of the other cool features in Town Square, and I'm going to show you the Town Square architectural um, architectural tool in, uh, at the end of this presentation, just so you have some familiarity with it in the event that you're not using it. It's great. It's included in the suite of services that we offer. And it's a great feature that, uh, that was implemented uh, within the last year. But one of the things that is also really helpful about that tool is that you can create 
um, uh, specific and custom forms for the type of project that is being submitted. So you might have five specific questions for someone who's going to install a roof versus 10 specific questions over someone who's going to install a pool. And you can uh, vary those applications based on the project type and make sure that you've got a complete uh, application, which saves a lot of the back and forth of the homeowner. Perfect. So it sounds like y'all have got the tools available to really establish a layperson and smooth process to, to make sure to make the ACC's job easier, make the owner's job easier as well. Hey, let me add in real quick, just a fun fact. We can actually add in a, a line item in an application we're building and we can put links in there mm -hmm. to go straight to policies. So if we're doing a fence application and there's a fence policy that is filed um, outside of the guidelines that brings more specifics, we can build that link right in while they're filling out their application, click the link, gather the info and then move forward. So I kind of awesome. love that feature. That's really cool. Uh, so the, the 40 lot count that, that Mitch mentioned earlier. So again, if you are more than 40, you must have an ACC or architectural review authority. All right. <clears throat> Association, it, it's all about maintaining efficiency, establishing new positions for community members to become involved, and then consistency with mod modifications and alterations in the community all about avoiding that arbitrary, capricious, discriminatory argument. Really avoid that. And how do you do that? You be consistent in enforcing of your guidelines and establishing a process. If you don't have guidelines, you should really consider getting them because no longer can board members wear that ACC hat. All right, so once the application reaches the board or the ACC, so again, um, we've got this kind of overlap that's occurring right now. September 1st was the deadline to separate it out. But the way the law was written, uh, there is a caveat where the board can wear both hats, a certain board member. So again, if, if y'all are struggling uphill and you have no ACC members and you have to act, get with Goodwin, get with your legal counsel, he or she may be able to explain kind of what that is. But once the board member's term, who is also wearing the ACC hat, once that term expires, legally, you've got to do the separation. That also extends to a spouse of a board member? Yeah, so probably not the spouse. Um, or someone residing. Yeah, yeah. So there, there's a new law, and, and we've got a slide on it for why there has to be separation legally. And so we'll, we'll get to that in a minute. So again, if you're having trouble get with Goodwin and we're gonna go over that here in, in a couple of slides. So how do we respond? Respond quickly and effectively and efficiently. Do it as quickly as you can. Send a denial ASAP if it's just not there. If you don't have the information, it is better to deny than it is to go back and say you need X, Y, and Z many times and I'll tell you why. And it really depends on your governing documents. It, it, you, you're running a slippery slope if you start exchanging emails back and forth with an owner because of this automatic approval provision. There are a lot of community declarations that say once an application gets submitted, a clock starts ticking. And if the ACC does not approve or deny an application within X days, a lot of it is 30, then the application is considered automatically approved. Mm -hmm. So why is it important to respond quickly? This is why. If your community has an auto approval restriction, and again, get with Goodwin. If you need counsel, get with them. But many times it's, it's easy to find in the, in the deed restrictions because if you do not approve or deny it, it is automatically approved. So what happens Mitch, when, when you engage in this back and forth email to get more, more information over and over and over again, and 30 days elapsed from the original submittal, where does the clock start? Yeah, and, and it's why, <clears throat> I mean, shameless plug to using a tool like Town Square or Smart Webs uh, for this process is that it helps manage and you start seeing a clock, right? One of the things that we do when we set up 
in, in the settings in this application is that as a homeowner submits an application, there's basically a clock that's running and it tells you you can prioritize by what's in the queue for approval and what that automatic approval window looks like so that you know, hey, at some point, if I'm going back and forth for a period of 30 days, I need to at some point make a decision that we're just going to reject this. And even though we're at the finish line with that homeowner, um, better to go on record to submit a verdict letter that says, hey, we've got to deny this project until more information is submitted. And that way we don't get stuck in the finger pointing of, hey, technically 30 days ran up and, and I'm good to go, right? I'm in the middle of it right now with a builder, Mitch. Mm -hmm. um, and this builder's building this happens all the time. 15 yeah. community, 15 yeah. homes. And there's three of them mm -hmm. where the ACC, you know, trying to be a good ACC and trying to work with this builder engaged in back and forth and the 30 day time elapsed. And now I'm trying to argue that the clock didn't start until this date, they're arguing another date. So don't go there. You can still do a rejection letter and comply with the 209 rejection requirements. But to Mitch's point, follow up with a phone call or email saying, hey, look, we were almost there. We just had to deny to follow our process. Resubmit, we'll put you at the top of the list because of all the work we've already put into it. The owner will appreciate that and, and understand, but as an ACC, this time frame is really, really important if you've got that auto approval provision. And, and that's why I, I can't stress enough just the importance of the actual form, right? The form uh, and why I love the customization features that we offer in this application on Town Square is that you can, you, you want to make sure and you can require these questions on the form. It's not like they can skip over it if, it, if you mark it as a requirement. You know, if there's a permit that need, that's needed in order to approve something, that homeowner can't physically complete the application until they actually upload a document to that form, right? And so, um, so it, it allows you to be very, very clear on what it is that you need in order to make a decision. And the more organized you are in your approach on that, the better off you're going to be. And that's something that you can work very closely with your manager. Uh, you know, one of our, our managers at, at Goodwin, you're assigned representative to help you know manage that we also have some experts in house that can help you build that out if, if you're not using it today but being very specific and leading someone to where you need them uh, really helps cut down on the back and forth on hey I didn't get this and uh, I need more information man it sounds like they they need that tool today that's a pretty that's, that's a really I mean, good tool it, it just takes the guesswork out of it right and don't wait the full 30 let, let, let's assume there's an auto deny 30 day and it's a very simple application, try to get it back to them in a reasonable amount of time because all that's gonna do is frustrate the owners, make them post where social media next door about how horrible we are. Uh, so look, a ACC, I know y'all likely have your hands full, but to the extent you can approve the easier applications a little quicker, I think that's really going to benefit the community as a whole, and it's going to make for happier owners. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, okay. So this is rare. Uh, I don't recommend using variance authority mm -hmm. often. It, you should really, really limit the use of this authority. What is variance authority? Um, you've got a rear yard setback of 15 feet for all improvements. The way this lot was set up is wacky topographically so that an owner really wants a pool and he has to encroach in that 15 foot setback, let's say five feet. In that instance, due to topographical issues, you want to grant a variance. Okay, that type of variance I could likely get on board with. Now, same situation, except they want to encroach 14 feet, i.e. they want to be one foot away from the rear yard lot line. That would be a no-go for me. And the thing you've got to think about on variance is, is, number one, do I even have the authority to grant a variance? Variance authority is not inherent. The ACC does not have auto variance authority. It must be specifically stated in your deed restrictions, in your declaration. If it's, if, if it's not there, you do not have it, number one. And number two, let's assume you do have variance authority. You've got to look at it and see what kind of authority you have. 
Many times the variance authority is limited to certain circumstances such as topography. Mm -hmm. So really look at that. An ACC variance authority should be used very, 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 very sparingly. And, and on variance authority, in my opinion, when you're wondering whether or not to grant it, go to your management team immediately. Mm -hmm. Don't do it just because you want to do it. Get advice from your manager and they may need to reach out to counsel to determine whether or not it's something you grant. And here's the risk with variances. If you keep granting them on something over and over and over again, what it's going to lead to is a waiver or abandonment of that deed restriction, which is a big no-no. You do not want to waive or abandon your deed restrictions because you keep on waiving and abandoning restrictions. Courts may find at some point in time that you have waived the entire declaration, i.e. there are no more deed restrictions on your community lots. So ACC, keep that in mind. Variance authority, use very sparingly. Clint, there are situations where a homeowner didn't understand that they lived in an HOA, went and made an improvement, and you know now the committee and the board is faced with this idea of you know, they went and installed something that was um, not something that the committee would have approved, but given all that they invested in this project, now you got to find yourself in a situation where you're like, all right, I guess we'll go ahead and let it go through. Right. Uh, best practice around recording that variance with that lot and, you know, the, the whole dynamics around that and why that's important. Yeah, so... Sometimes somebody asks for forgiveness, not permission, and whether it's intentional or not, most of the time I think it's intentional, but maybe not always. Uh, you've got to look at the egregiousness of it, right? How bad was the violation? If it's really, really bad, i.e. painting your house pink mm -hmm. in an earth tone community, um, that's something you're likely going to have to push back on and force them to repaint their home. Other things, maybe you can grant a variance. And what I like to th think about in terms of variances is thinking outside of the box. And so maybe you do what's called a kind of a conditional variance mm -hmm. where you get to keep the, and, and I'm going to use roofing as an example, sure. uh, Hill Country, and I think Dallas as well had a big hail mm -hmm. storm, hail storms earlier this year. And we're a black roof community. Yep. Somebody installs a very light brown roof and it's, that's expensive. It's not cheap. Insurance won't pay to replace it to the black. What do you do? I like these conditional variances where you, it's an honest mistake. Mm -hmm. You allow them the variance. Um, and so they can keep their light brown roof until one of two events happens. Another property damage event mm -hmm. occurs where you've got to do a partial or full replacement of the roof. And that event, they've got to bring it back to black or they put their house on the market to sell. Mm -hmm. So if one of those two events happens, a trigger occurs and, and the trigger is you must bring it back to black roofing. Uh, those conditional variances are important. And then to Mitch's point, you need to record the variance in the real property records especially if it's conditional because it puts the title companies on notice yep. that there is some sort of violation and the ACC and our board has granted a variance as it relates to that violation. I wanted to speak to one other concept and, and get your opinion on this and, and, and our panel. Um, there's this whole, many communities institute this concept of uh, this kind of good neighbor approval. And they've got this concept where, hey, if you're gonna go install a pool, you, need to go get the signature of your neighbor to let them know or seek their approval about the uh, project that's going to be uh, completed. Right. Um, how much weight does that carry? Is there a world that I live in where if my neighbor who doesn't already like me says, nope, uh, I don't like the idea of that. I don't want your kids splashing around the backyard and keeping me up at night. Um, do I need to, is that uh, enforceable? You know, it, it, my legal opinion, it should carry zero weight. Mm -hmm. um, I don't even think it should be a factor in the ACC's decision because the AC, it's the ACC's job to look at the deed restrictions and approve or deny it. It doesn't matter if Mitch's neighbor likes what Mitch wants to install in his backyard. 
It has everything to do with the deed restrictions. And I know there's this good neighbor idea. Yeah. And, and look, I get it. Um, what I recommend if the ACC or board really wants something like that, maybe it's more of a notification right. requirement rather than a sign off approve requirement. Because I've found that sometimes if you get the sign off, you approve it, but then the guy builds something a little bit out of line, it's right. still approved, uh, still approvable. It makes the neighbor angry because it's this isn't what I approved. And <laughs> I didn't approve this. I have been there. Before. Oh boy. Yeah. It's, it's a, a double, big mess. It's a double edged sword. You want to, you know, you want somebody, you want the neighbors to kind of work it out before it gets to the committee so that they're not held accountable for it. But ultimately, you know, somebody's going to walk away a loser in the deal. And it's a, you know, it's tough. It's a tough dynamic. And just ACC, just keep in mind that you are the decision making body. It's, it's, it's a, it can be a tough job, but just, understand that you will have the backing of your board, your, your management team, and your council. Mm -hmm. Just follow the rules, follow your guidelines as best you can, and you will have background. And remember, you've got that qualified immunity bubble, that protection for you too. So I'm going to speed this up a little bit. So uh, owners delinquent on fines or assessments, can we just deny an application because they're delinquent? No unless your governing documents allow you to do it. And it's fairly rare. It is yeah. very rare. I, you know, Mitch, probably on two hands yeah. for the communities I, I represent. So can you just put it in your guidelines or is it something that needs to be in your deed restrictions? I, you know, I think that's one where it's not a clarifying term. You're creating a new restriction. So yeah, yeah, I would I would lean towards it needing to be in your in your deed restrictions. Very good question. Which in most cases requires a majority vote of the membership. So on all of these slides, Goodwin has a very good kind of legislative update presentation that y'all can turn to, um, but I'm going to go over them briefly. Swimming pool fences, we can't regulate black mesh, black um, mm -hmm. metal frame that's six feet high. We cannot regulate it. So if that's what they want to install, they get to install it. Mm -hmm. Other types of enclosures, we can regulate. ACC members, this is what Mitch was alluding to earlier in the presentation. You cannot serve on the ACC if, and here are the three ifs, you're a current board member. There's an exception that you may be able to use, get with Goodwin and your counsel if you have to. Number two, you are a current board member's spouse. Or number three, you are a person residing in a current board member's household. If you are one of those three, you cannot serve on the ACC. Uh, number two, an, a, an owner is now permitted by law to appeal a decision by the ACC directly to the board, and the board gets to decide that appeal. You've also got to provide a notice of denial, including the basis for denial and reasonable detail and changes, if any, for a conditional approval. And you've got to provide that um, to the owner, and then you've got to hold the hearing within 30 days after the date the owner receives an, the board receives an owner's request for a hearing. So board or ACC denies the improvement. You send your letter, you give them 30 days to request a hearing. If they request it, you've got 30 days to hold the hearing. So it's the 30-30 rule. And this became effective September 1st. Uh, Mitch, we were chatting earlier, but you've y'all got a whole process mm -hmm. that Goodwin already follows to comply with this new law. Mm -hmm. Perfect. All right. Again, noticing requirements. Um, this is important for the hearing. Small hearings, I don't know that you really need counsel to get involved, but complex hearings that you know are going to be contested, i.e. hearings related to a $120,000 pool, get your counsel involved. Mm -hmm. You need to have a coaching session. If you don't want your counsel present, at least get some coaching with Goodwin and with your counsel because it is a $150,000 mistake and there's gonna be somebody recording this. Uh, recording is permitted and that recording can be used against the association if there's litigation down the road. So you've gotta be careful with how the hearing is conducted which is why you need to get your counsel involved. All right. Um, 
you've got to provide some some evidence this relates to kind of deed restriction violations and for those who are interested in kind of the the whole hearing process uh clint uh and i recorded a webinar on this very topic mm -hmm. so um i will send out instructions after the webinar with uh, a link to that recording as well and you can dive in it's kind of the 102 of this right? perfect yeah, yeah absolutely it I mean, that, that's it, Mitch and I, I spend the hour on yeah. is 209 hearing. So yeah. it, it really digs in deep. And then finally, security measures. Uh, ACCs, be aware that there are certain fences that uh, owners get to install in their front yard now and other security measures. So uh, y'all should have some new rules and policies that are being implemented or have already been implemented make sure ACC members you're aware of the new security members that owners get to have so that you can approve or deny an application for a security measure in accordance with the law. Hey, Ken, I have a quick yeah. question. Does the, does the, go back to the other slide because now I'm, it's erasing. Okay. Um, so the perimeter fencing, when an application comes in for perimeter fencing in the front yard, do they have to claim security? Like if we're looking at an application, they haven't said anything about security, but I see a fence forward of the front building line. Do we treat it as that? Or do we do they have to state that this is for security purposes and then that's how we move forward? Boy, oh boy, what a good question. Um, it, you know, it, it, you've got to really look at the application. If they want a perimeter fence and it's on the perimeter, and they're making the application and you've got a policy in place, your best bet likely is to review it as if it were a security measure fence. Okay. Now, you know, if they're wanting to install a two foot tall uh, picket, I don't even know what they're called, but you know. Like a landscaping fence. Yeah, yeah, like a landscaping fence. That's not a security measure fence. You can deny it um, because it, it is obviously not being utilized as a deterrent. And virtually every one of our communities just, um, you know, with the help of folks like Clint, uh, just passed a security measures policy um, in indirect uh, response to the legislative changes that, that uh, went underway. And so, uh, you know, the, the specifics around the types and, and materials and height and everything else around, uh, you know, those perimeter fences uh, should all be spelled out in those guidelines. Uh, wanted to take a, a quick second to offer you just a quick visual for those of you who have never seen this feature in Town Square, the one I referenced earlier. It's kind of a shameless plug here, but something I think is incredibly valuable. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, is not an additional cost to the association. Uh, this is a tool that is highly customizable, allows for a homeowner just the same way that they submit a request or check their account balance or make a payment. You can now uh, also... Uh, submit an architectural request. So I took some screenshots here. Um, one section of this is the ability for the uh, for the homeowner. You go into that green button up at the top and hit submit project. Uh, there, in a homeowner's view, they would see any project that they've ever submitted from an architectural committee view or from a board view, if the, the board has access to seeing all this stuff, even though they're not voting on it, um, from a architectural view, you have the ability to see everything that's in the queue to approve. Um, and so you can see exactly what, and you can filter by status, what's been declined, what's been approved, what type of project, you can search by keyword, whatever it is, or look for a specific unit and, and reference any of the requests that have come through on that unit, you hit the green button and something like this will appear a form. And this form is very customizable. Uh, so the homeowner uh, just notes uh, the, their address of the unit, uh, can name a project name, uh, submit it to a specific category if you have multiple categories. So I can have a uh, fence category, I can have a paint category, a roof category, I can have any number of categories you want and ask very specific questions around uh, what types of things that you want to include or you want the homeowner to include. Uh, you can also, you have the option of just uh, creating multiple choice questions, all different types of questions. So you create these online forms and the homeowner completes that, hits submit, they can attach additional documentation, um, all kinds of good stuff that you can do with that. 
Uh, from there, as a, as a committee member, there's different stages. So you'll see it's kind of light, light green. Uh, you'll see that uh, where we are in the project phase. So from submission to review uh, to then voting, right? So the committee goes in, they see, okay, I'm gonna vote on this. Uh, cool thing, they see all the details, they see all the attachments. You can add comments. If you look down at the bottom of the screen, you can add comments to the voting committee. Uh, so you can work with your committee members and say, hey, I, I like the idea of this, but here's some things that I think we need to uh, approve uh, with a condition of these certain items. And then you can include the homeowner into specific conversation on behalf of the committee. So there's a little button down at the bottom and it says also send to the homeowner. So you can be very specific about what you want to bring the homeowner into if you'd like to, if you need something, hey, Clarity, hey, can you send me... Um, a copy of the permit. I didn't see that it was the right one or it wasn't updated. Uh, can you send me copies of the paint chip, uh, whatever it is that, that you need in order to make a decision? And you can include them specifically into that project. Then after you approve uh, or deny that project, um, we have the ability to uh, download a verdict letter. So the decision of the committee, whether it's conditioned upon approval or whatever else, prompts a letter and that letter is a form letter. And we've started adding in additional language to comply with the statutory requirements around, hey, if you are receiving a rejection, um, here's what you could do in order to get this approved. And also uh, know that there's this process by which you can be heard before the board and go through that hearing process, uh, but makes it very easy. And then delivery of that letter is sent to the homeowner uh, through town square and via email so that they're alerted to the verdict of that project. Uh, one of the things that I wanted to point out is also that there's a settings category. So to what we talked about earlier, there might be a number of, you might have a committee of three. And so you want to uh, create, you know, hey, each project requires the approval based on a number of votes or by percentage of the committee. So 51% voting in a certain way uh, deems that project to be approved or denied. And, um, and then you can also create the number of days by which uh, a project would be deemed approved or denied um, and a um, you know, number of different features from that standpoint. So uh, very customizable, very uh, easy. It gives you as a board member the ability to review these applications from anywhere using your, mo your mobile device. Uh, you can download the Town Square app and you can review them on the go, right? You don't have to, you know, wait until um, you're getting these via email or, and missing things. It just allows for greater organization. And we've seen the number of architectural requests multiply. I don't know, Nicole, you, you live this every day, but I think we've gone like tenfold. Um, it's been constant COVID. since the beginning of COVID. Yeah, it has yeah. not stopped. It hasn't yeah, folks who are now working from home, uh, now they're taking a little more interest in the appearance of their home because they've been home, right? And so they want to they want to make those improvements. We've seen a lot of turnover in communities, a lot of new you know new folks moving to Texas, and um, and so they want to you know improve the home that they buy. And so there's been just an astronomical number of of uh, architectural requests, and you know we've been working really hard to make that an easier process, but. Great tool, something that you can put into play very quickly and you can modify as you go. And then I mentioned that there's also the website feature where we can add some additional instructions. We've got some great samples of communities that do that. They direct the homeowner to the website. Homeowner goes to that sub page, says, I want an architectural request. And then it walks them through the specific instructions on how to get that application approved. Um, so the more we make that clearer, the more, the easier it is to instruct the homeowner, the better. And the one thing that I will tell you, you know, as kind of a closing thought is that as an architectural committee uh, team, one thing that I would encourage you to do and encourage, and, and I certainly encourage our team to do all the time is just remind the community and really campaign out there to say, hey, before you, you decide to make any investment to your home, go through the process of approval. There are many people who are moving into your communities day in and day out, 
and they've never lived in an HOA before. And no matter how many documents they get at closing, they just don't understand this whole process of, I got to go ask my neighbors for approval on a project. Well, yes, you do, because you live in a deed restricted community. And so the more that we can campaign around, hey, just, you know, I, I, would, I would encourage you at a minimum on a quarterly basis to send out a reminder and e-blast to the community to say, hey, if you are planning a project or did you know that uh, these are approved colors or did you know if you're interested in installing a pool, there's you know certain things you need to be aware of. But the more you create awareness around this, the easier it is for you to, uh, to start to receive more compliance and you avoid those very sticky situations of folks who circumvent the process and you gotta get into these variance discussions and all kinds of other things. Um, but create awareness. Um, the more we do that, the better off we are. Absolutely, Mitch. Can't, can't agree more. All about ed educating your community members. Yeah. Anything to add to that, Nicole B? Um, this recording will be available later to share with other committee members that weren't able to log on tonight, today. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, we will send out the recording of this. We also um, include it on our, our Facebook page and in a library of videos there. And uh, we'll encourage and hopefully this will just be a part of the process and onboarding a new board member. They'll have an opportunity to kind of check this out and get familiar with all the good things that Clint shared today. And, um, and yeah, uh, please, if you're on a board and you've got new committee members you've recruited, uh, forward my email out to uh, those individuals and encourage them to check this out on their time. And uh, hopefully we won't bore them too much. Yeah. Uh, through the process, but uh, a lot of good nuggets of wisdom here. <laughs> and again, um, you know, we'll get into questions in a second, but, uh, you know, please, you know, if you're, if you're in need of, uh, of a contact, if you're in need of any of the clarity of any of the stuff that we've discussed today, Clint is a fantastic resource and he's got a team that regardless of what market you're in, in Texas, um, RMWBH is a great partner and they are all over the place. So, uh, please don't hesitate to reach out and, uh, and get some sound advice on, uh, avoiding some of these pitfalls that we've discussed today. Thank you, Mitch. And thank you all for having me today. We want to see if there are any questions. Yeah, absolutely. If there's any, anybody, uh, has submitted any questions, please feel free to let us know. Whoa. Uh, we got a few on here and I'll uh, we'll see if we can run through some of these very quickly. Thank you guys for submitting those. I didn't see any, uh, uh, pop-ups. Uh, so when a resident homeowner makes an unapproved change that is a major expensive change, what options does the HOA have for recourse? I'm referring to something like a roof that does not match the neighborhood and was not approved. I think we touched on that. Yeah. Um, you know, there, there is this variance uh, option where you can make a deal with that homeowner that, hey, um, while it wasn't cool that you did what you did, uh, we'll go ahead and record it as a variance. And um, there might be, I mean, how do you speak to some of the fining and yeah, and, maybe, maybe there's fining involved, mm -hmm. Mitch, if, if you've got the authority to find, you may have to levy some fines as well. Yep. yep. And let's, and we're assuming you've got that variance authority. Yep. Yeah. And so, I mean, in, in those very rare instances, and I hope that's rare, uh, there is some recourse that the association has, um, you know, one of them is you could force someone to undo what they did, right. Repaint their home or, uh, pull out, uh, uh, the fence that they installed or, um, or replant the tree that they pulled out of their front yard, right? So there are things that uh, there is certainly a lot of, of recourse that an association can take in order to gain compliance and kind of undo whatever was done. But again, that kind of speaks back to the importance of just kind of creating awareness and creating this campaign of, of uh, letting people know that, hey, this is really important to get approval before you do something. Uh, in, keeping, in keeping approval fast, because I've seen so many times applications start, I have a, a committee that's kind of key hawing and discussing too long, that homeowner goes on with that $150,000 pool project. And then for some reason, it's in an easement, and they seen that it was in the easement in the beginning. So just hurrying up and voting on that type of project is going to save a lot of things too, because I've seen it too many times. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, you know, this whole idea of easements, I mean, and this is probably something that you know, maybe we do a 201 type course at some point on this, but, you know, understanding how to read a survey and understanding how to, 
You know, there are very specific things that you want to make sure that someone is installing on their property and not encroaching on somebody else's property on an easement. Uh, so all kinds of things around that, that, you know, unfortunately we didn't get uh, to go too much into detail today, um, but uh, so important that uh, we have clarity around, you know, where things are being installed and that those plans are very specific to that. Absolutely. No, plats and surveys are huge for architectural control committees. Um, great question from Kevin. An original developer didn't allow for flagpoles that are now being requested. How do we adopt allowances for things like a flagpole? And, you know, whether it, it was in the documents or maybe it was silent and the developer said, hey, no flagpoles, but um, you know, how do we, how do we get around some of that stuff? Well, yeah. So if, if you don't have a flagpole policy, you very well may be missing a lot of other things. That was a 2011 law change, yeah. 2011 legislative session. So get with your Goodwin management team ASAP, because it sounds like your legal counsel needs to help y'all in adopting some policies. One of those being flagpole policies. Mm -hmm. Do changes to the guidelines have to be filed with the county as well? And the answer is yes. I mean, when in doubt, file, right? And when in doubt, uh, record with the county and that uh, should cover your bases there. Should there be fees associated with an ACC application if they are not called out in the governing documents? That's a, I mean, that's, a, that's an interesting point. Um, I will say that one thing that we will be making available here in short order is the ability for an association to uh, set a price or, or, or a charge for a review, um, largely because some of these more complicated projects and communities who have, weren't able to find a volunteer to sit on the committee, now we're looking at outsourcing a lot of the authority of the review to a third party who charges for that service. And it's something candidly that we're looking at um, just because we've had so many clients who have come to us and say, hey, we're never gonna be able to recruit people to, to, to stay involved in this. Um, and so we need somebody to handle it. And we also wanna make sure that it's somebody who's gonna make a sound decision here and help you know, manage this process. So it's not a bad best practice, but it also discourages people to submit applications sometimes to avoid the fee. So I don't know that there's a good or bad answer to it, but if your documents allow it or if they don't speak to it, it's something you, we may want to consider. Um, yeah, you may have to look look at an, an amendment yeah. uh, to what type of document. That's kind of a, a legal counsel question. Uh, your counsel is really going to have to dig in and kind of give an opinion on that, whether or not you've got the authority to levy a fee or whether or not you can amend a document to add that fee levy authority. Yep. Um, Another question, what if you can't get volunteers? And this is a great question. Maybe, you know, Nicole D, you can speak to what are some of the things that your communities have done to be able to recruit volunteers? Um, you know, I, I certainly think that there's there's so much know-how and expertise in th residing in our communities and trying to find folks to be a part of this is uh, certainly an important task. There are situations where, you know, it might be 41 homes in a community and you're now beholden to this new requirement and it's really hard to find somebody. Um, I will say that, um, and this is, you know, you can weigh in on this, but uh, just because you used to be in that role of approving these requests, um, you know, that you're still available. I, I think there's still discretion in saying that a committee or whoever has the, whoever has been given the approval authority over these applications, there's nothing in the documents to say that they can't ask for help, they can't ask for assistance or guidance. And so, you know, if there are uh, folks like yourself who have this institutional knowledge, um, there's nothing that says, hey, I can't go ask an opinion. Um, I wouldn't rubber stamp a, you know, approve or deny verdict on something, um, but you can still stay involved and help guide a committee, maybe serve as a liaison to that committee. Absolutely. Um, that, that's what I was going to ask. We have um, an architectural liaison from the board. Um, that's what I was going to suggest. Yeah, just don't decision make. Um, and absolutely, I, I think liaisons are huge for these new ACC committees because they, they really do need some experience and, and knowledge base to, to share. Uh, question to uh, what happens if the application is submitted to the management company, but it doesn't reach the ACC or board? Does the clock, clock start running with reaching the management company? 
I'd probably say yes. I yes. mean, if, if the instructions are, hey, submit this to management, and, and this is why I'm such a big proponent of, you know, a tool like Town Square, you can imagine a world where uh, in some communities we're getting dozens of applications a month. It's really hard when you're managing every single item in your inbox and one slips through or gets caught up in somebody's spam folder or whatever. Um, if there's not a clear place to drive, you know, homeowners to, uh, to a tool like Town Square, or to smart webs, man, it, it starts getting really hard to manage the volume of that. So uh, I would tell you, um, yeah, do whatever possible. Use these tools that we make available because we don't want to, you know, find ourselves in a situation where we're like, oh God, we didn't, uh, you know, we missed something. And sometimes there's good reason for it. Some people are still mailing applications by mail to the, to our management oh, office. Yeah. I'm like, no way, don't do that. Right. <laughs> like, um, I, I, somebody asked me the other day, do we have a fax number so I can fax my application? I'm like, please don't, yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> not let's, let, let's, let's get away from faxes. And that way we've got, uh, you know, we've got technology that we can rely on to keep it all in focus. <laughs> I received a paint application on the fax. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Good luck you... So conditional approvals, Mitch, we chatted about that briefly. I'm okay with them as long as the conditions are not too complex. Mm -hmm. Very simple conditional approvals are okay. If they're complex, you need to deny and tell them this is what you need to do, resubmit. Uh, question. One of our problems is plausible denial regarding the covenants and the requirement to obtain approval of a project, especially after they've already made the purchase or signed a contract. How do we deal with this? And how can we prove that they actually did receive them? Oh, um, yeah, it doesn't matter whether or not they actually receive them. So the minute the covenants are filed in the real property records, Texas Property Code says you have notice. Mm -hmm. So there is no plausible denial. You are charged with notice of the deed restrictions because it is attached to and binds your property. Think of it kind of like uh, an easement, right? There's a drainage easement or an electrical easement running through the middle of your lot. You buy the lot and you say, well, nobody told me about that easement. Sorry, the easement's been recorded. Mm -hmm. It binds the property and it follows that property in perpetuity. So plausible denial doesn't work. Connie has a great question. City laws and zoning, um, and this is this is kind of happening right now as we speak with folks who are like, hey, I'm gonna go install a perimeter fence. And a lot of confusion, Clint, around, um, hey, the, the city might have a zoning ordinance or an ordinance around uh, front fences, and let's say that they're prohibited, but now the statute's saying I have to allow it to happen. What do I oh, do there? I, I imagine- I love this. City code enforcement are going crazy oh, yeah. right now with this silly law. Yeah. Because so, we don't have the authority to enforce city code. Mm -hmm. And yet we have this city code that says no X, Y, and Z type fencing, or you're on a corner line. Mm -hmm. You're allowed to, you're required to allow for certain visibility mm -hmm. feet. Yep. It is a complete and utter mess. So for a lot of the communities that are in city limits, if they've told us they're in the city limits, we try to build in ordinances as a guide um, but, you know, we don't have the authority to enforce. Mm -hmm. So unless we've got some sort of requirement that for things that require a permit, you've got to submit a permit along with your application. If your documents don't require permitting, uh, then there's not much you can do other than notify code enforcement or tell the owner, hey, owner, we're in the city of Leander. It's probably a good idea mm -hmm. for you to make sure this fence is okay with them. Uh, before you spend, you know, all that money and, on it. And to that point, there are um, many uh, communities who have incorporated that language into their application. And they'll say something to the effect of um, the association's approval of your application is binding on the understanding that the project has been approved or is in accordance with any local or, you know, ordinances or, uh, yep. uh, or regulations. And uh, that kind of serves as at least something that puts the owner on notice that, hey, go check and make sure that you don't need a permit, that you're, you know, that we're not going to have any kind of issues with the city. Um, because if we approve it, not knowing that there was something else that the city requires, that's on you and the city. 
Yep. Right? Yeah. yeah, it's important to put that disclaimer mm -hmm. in there and encourage them to get city approval. Mm -hmm. We've got another one kind of going back to that notice, uh, the plausible deniability. So to be clear, they don't have to get a copy of the deed restrictions. Mm -hmm. They don't have to get it. The law says the minute it gets filed in the county records, you are you have notice whether or not you got a copy of it or not. So, you know, they are charged with notice. All right. Oh, well, well, the city city said the HOA can have a more strict law. No, we can't because of the law change. So maybe the city's not aware of the new security measures oh, yeah. law. Yeah, there's a new law, so we can't be more strict on perimeter fencing. We can designate type of fencing, but we do have to allow it. One last thing before we close, and this is something that you'll start to see more of as committee members, and that is religious displays. Many of the policies addressing religious displays that, um, that attorneys like Clint drafted for our associations require that the association's committee architectural committee review those requests before they are installed, but that is a very sticky one. And I will tell you that if you have a situation and it's an easy way to end up on the news, uh, uh, if you don't feel good about denying or approving something, ask for help, please ask for help, ask management, when in doubt, ask legal counsel, uh, that's what they're there for. But careful, cautious. Um, there's going to be seasons in your time as a committee member, election season, uh, where there's all kinds of just craziness happening and you never feel like you're on the right side of it. Uh, so when there's something that could end up on the front page of the paper or in the news, uh, when in doubt, ask. Yep. And, it, you know, kind of almost layperson or common sense approach, American flags, mm -hmm. and you're unsure, you know, you're about to deny something, oh, yeah. reach out, political signs, yeah. and religious displays. Those yeah. are all things that you don't want your community on, on the news on. Energy, Absolutely. Things under the guise of energy management, uh, water conservation, you know, a lot of this, a lot of the statutory language is, has been created to allow this stuff to happen. Uh, so if you're not in the know about that stuff, just, you know, if it, if it sounds like it's a decent idea, but not something that you see throughout the community, go ahead and ask, because there's, there's probably something to that that we need to explore. And you know, I think the safest thing in all cases if, is you can always reject something. And then that homeowner, if that homeowner challenges on appeal and they've got, you know, sound guidance as to why, um, then you can always reverse something, but you can't always reverse something after you've approved it because now you've got um, action being taken and investments being made and undoing that gets really sticky. Yep. Yeah. That's what we're here for. We're here to help you and guide you. And we do this all day, every day, and we stay up on the laws and we engage in a lot of training. So um, don't ever think that uh, you can't ask us because that's what we're here for. Awesome. Well, hey guys, we'll we'll go ahead and uh, sign off. Thank you, uh, Clint, for your time. Yeah, you're welcome, Mitch. Nicole and Dee, thanks for your contributions. Uh, appreciate every one of you who took the time to join us today. Um, awesome. I always appreciate the investment of time to find out how to do something better. And thank you for your service to your community. It's an incredibly important one, and you don't realize how important it is until something happens in the community. So. Uh, you know, what you do matters. And I appreciate your service. And thank you for taking the time to be with us today. Yes. Uh, we'll thank you all. Thank you. Bye, everybody.